trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Amen? Don't you like those old hymns? I sure do. I sure enjoy them. Hey, a couple things. Are we dismissing the children this morning? Okay. A couple things. First, uh, Edith and I, I know we had a note put in the bulletin, but we still wanted to thank you and uh, for uh, Pastor Appreciation Day last week. And uh, it was just awesome. It was so enjoyable. And I can tell you, I really felt appreciated. All the cards from the children and from you all, I took time to go through every one of them last night. And uh, now some of your writing was a little difficult. And then when you, <laughs> when you take a red pen and you write on a red card, it makes it really difficult. But that's all right. I won't mention any names. And, uh, but uh, I, I did read all the cards and just felt very, very, very appreciated. And as I went through those cards and the gifts and everything y'all did for us, I was thinking, oh, man, I should have took the pulpit committee search team up on when they said, Pastor Mike, would you maybe put your name in the hat for being the next pastor? And I'm thinking, oh, man, I missed it. I should have done that. You made me feel so welcome. So we, we just wanted to say thank you. Uh, we, we couldn't have felt more appreciated, seriously. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you from the depths of our heart. We really did appreciate it. And it's a good, it's a good feeling to have, especially in this world today. Amen? All right. And then, uh, then the next thing, just before we go, and uh, I was going to show a little clip here in just a second, but also always for your prayers, because I, I feel like I've, I've pastored three churches, and somehow or another I have the care. <laughs> Paul said I have the care of all the churches on me. Past, Paul did a whole lot more than I ever would dream of doing, and he founded a lot of churches, and he wrote letters back to those churches, as you know, but he also had the care of those churches continuously on him. So I'm still, I'm still the pastor of a lot of people uh, everywhere, uh, even up in Michigan. I won't be here on November the 11th and the 12th because a couple that years ago, we knew them, and uh, they'd they, after we left, they ended up getting a divorce. They've been divorced for, goodness, maybe 20, 25 years. And the Lord is working it out for them to forgive each other. It was a terrible, pretty difficult divorce to forgive each other. And I've been doing Zoom counseling with them for the last several months. And uh, I'm going there on a Saturday to remarry them. And so it's a wonderful testimony of reconciliation, forgiveness, redemption. And, uh, and so it's, it'll be a special time. So, so I have the care of those churches. Yesterday, I preached a funeral in Bedford, Virginia, beautiful Bedford, Virginia, right there by sharp top, flat top mountains. I used to climb all the time in my younger days. And, uh, and, uh, and, and right now, the leaves are in full turn, you know, what do you call it, foliage. It's beautiful. And I preached a funeral there yesterday of a 99-year-old lady. Uh, the last few years, I preached the funeral of one of my dear friends. She was 106 years old, and sweet lady came to church up to just the time she passed away on her own, walk in the door on her own. And uh, then another dear friend, she was 102 years old, and uh, Estelle, and just preached her funeral just before I left. This lady was 99 years old. She would have been 100 come, the, uh, come January. But anyway, they're in beautiful Bedford, and, uh, but, but she was a poet. She was a poet. She didn't get saved till later in life. She had seven children. <clears throat> she <clears throat> took in a foster son and, and, and raised him, so eight children. And that was after her other children were all grown and gone. She took in this 13-year-old boy, and he was there for the service yesterday. And uh, at the end of the service, about seven or eight people looked up at me and said they prayed the prayer and asked the Lord to come in their heart. This lady didn't get saved till she was probably in her 40s, but she had a powerful witness in ministry for the Lord, and that kind of prompted me even to change my message that I was going to preach today uh, to another message that uh, I felt like the Lord's laid on my heart as a result of that. But I want you to meet uh, th this dear lady, and uh, Doris McGuinn is her name, and uh, we have a 30-second video of a poem that she's quoted. So let's see if it works. By step and with my Savior leading, step by step I go along life's way.
follow me, his voice to me is pleading. Follow me and I will show the way. Through the darkness of a passing hour, strength you'll find and courage from above. Step by step, he leads me with his power. Step by step, he leads me with his love. <laughs> Amen. All right. I just wish everybody here would have met this dear lady. Love the Lord, love people, smile, just awesome. She's 99 years old there. And uh, when someone of my friends made this little video just a few months ago. And so uh, just wanted to share her with you and uh, encourage you to just keep on keeping on. She never quit uh, and being a witness for the Lord. So let's go ahead and dismiss the children. And so young people go enjoy children's church. And uh, God bless you children for all those notes. <laughs> I had to be careful Brother Josh, that I didn't get proud because they kept saying over and again. I think somebody might have gave them some words to say. Maybe Sunday school teachers had their, like, media people. They kind of get their notes together and say the same thing. So those kids would say, you're the best. You're the best. You're the best. So I had to really work on We talked about pride this morning, so... I'm going to have to really work on that after reading all those notes from those kids last night. All right. I, I actually had prepared a message out of Matthew chapter 24, especially dealing with end time events. And actually, I put together several messages uh, over maybe the next few weeks to bring. But I know there's some breaks that are going to happen with Brother Dave next week, Mason, and then, uh, then the homecoming, and I'll be gone that weekend possibly. I'll try to get back, but I'm not sure how flights work for that. But, uh, but I, I prepared a message for today entitled, And Then Shall the End Come. And that's a part of a verse in Matthew chapter 24 where the disciples had asked Jesus, What shall be the end of the age? And Jesus starts answering their question, and he says this, and then shall the end come. And then shall the end come. So that's the title of that message I'm not going to preach today, all right? You're going to have to wait for that. But we live in probably today one of the most dangerous and precarious times that, that I can think back, and I love history, in the history of the world. I mean, it's just not a matter of war and uh, battles in, in Israel or Ukraine and now Russia and China have grown into these, Iran, North Korea, all these things are happening. And, and it's not just a matter of a war between a couple countries. It, it, it could, what's happening now could easily break out into World War III. And now we have nuclear weapons. I mean, I mean, it's, it's a dangerous, precarious time. And I don't know if you feel the tension. I mean, I'm at the point, I can't watch the news. I just can't watch any more of the things that are taking place. It's just like I try to catch up a little bit because I don't want to be, like, ignorant. But at the same time, it, it's really difficult. But it's also causing anxiety. And, and I'm a person that doesn't feel anxiety. I really have one of these people, you, my wife can tell you, I don't worry, I just don't fret. Uh, first chapter I memorized in the Bible was Psalm 37, just about. Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thou envious of the workers of iniquity. <laughs> so don't fret. And, and I've been that way. Yet I find myself kind of fretting these days and having some anxiety that I've never really had to deal with before as I start hearing some of this stuff, and I know a lot of things that are going on with it, and even in the backgrounds of some of these things, sometimes I'm told things. So where, where with, with the violence and the corruption and all that's taken place, where do we get our comfort and how do we handle it? And so I'm going to talk about our comfort and our ministry, comfort and ministry. We need comfort today, Amen. We, we need to sense somebody coming alongside of us and stronger than us, bigger than us, greater than us, giving us comfort and helping us through a tough and difficult time. 
And the truth is, all of us have personal needs, personal problems. Uh, you, we never know when we go to the doctor that he's not going to say, you know, I found a spot, I found a lump, I found something that doesn't look good, and you hear you have cancer. We have friends that have been told they have cancer, and within a few days, or COVID, and within a few weeks, they're, they're, they're gone, and they, they weren't all that old, and they were here one day, the next day they're gone. You see that happening. And, and the older you get, like me, your friends are dying that are your age, and you go, whoops, that just, wow, it just happened. It, they were healthy yesterday, and they're gone. And, and so as we deal with all, all that, where do we find real comfort, comfort that's lasting and peace that's beyond understanding, that peace that Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. Give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Where do we find that kind of comfort and peace? And so we're going to be looking at the book of, uh, of, of, of 2 Corinthians, and a few things I believe the Lord's spoken to me about out of that passage. But let me remind you in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, but this know that in the last days perilous times will come. So we shouldn't be surprised. The Apostle Paul wrote this 2,000 years ago. Now, honestly, the last days began 2,000 years ago, okay? You've got to understand that. Paul said we're living in the last days. That was 2,000 years ago. So now, if 2,000 years ago the apostles were living in the last days, you know what we're living in? We're living in the last of the last of the last last days, all right? And we know it must be getting closer to the end, and we'll talk about that in the other message, and then shall the end come. And he says this, so I just wanted to read these verses. For men shall be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, they do it in the name of their God, but denying its power from such people turn away. And so, man, boy, he gave a pretty good description of a lot of things happening today. Now, Paul also wrote about this in Romans chapter 1. Now, he wasn't talking about the last times. He was talking about what happens when people aren't thankful and they become fools. They think they're wise, he says, and they think they're wise and they become fools. And then he goes on to talk about when they start worshiping the creature rather than the creator, and then how the family and even the gender stuff all comes up there in Romans chapter 1, and the homosexuality and all the immorality. And then he finishes that chapter with these words, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Wow, it's like just, it just goes on and on. You're going, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's like you hear about all around us today. And the world is getting worse. And the reason I say these are the most precarious, most dangerous times ever in human history One reason is there's more people on planet Earth than has ever been here before. We're getting close to 8 billion people on planet Earth. And then he says in verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, all those people we just talked about, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, they not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. The people that practice all those things we just talked about, He said, they get approval today. And those who are righteous and try to do right, you don't get approval. You get condemned and you get persecuted. 
And so we, we def, definitely are living in those days. So, so how do we handle it? Now, the book of 2 Corinthians, if you just stand, I want to read a few verses here from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 7. So it's just this morning I decided to, 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 to bring a message from this, this book. So that's why there's not a PowerPoint. They might, they might keep up with some verses, and they're pretty good if they can do that because they, they didn't get forewarned. So God bless you guys back there. So in 2 Corinthians 1 through 3, chapter 1, 3 through 7, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we're afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are partaker of the sufferings, so also you will partake of the consolation. Wow. God tells us we can be comforted in our suffering. Father, please speak to us through these words that you've put on my heart to share today. And may God your will be done in this place in every heart and every life and bring peace and comfort as we truly trust in our resurrected Savior to meet every need in our life. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. And you can be seated. When you look at the books of First and Second Corinthians, a couple things that will help you as you read through these books. The, first, the book of First Corinthians is a letter of correction, a letter of correction to a carnal and a backslidden church. Now, Paul founded the church at Corinth. I mean, he is the founding pastor. Acts chapter 17 tells the story of going to this church and founding this church and what took place. And so, I mean, he is, I mean, he's the man, you know, that God used to give 13 books of the New Testament to us. And he went on these missionary journeys, and he went through an awful lot of things. But here, he founded this church. But then he gets word later that this church is in a mess. It is a mess. It's a confused church. It's a church where people are fighting with each other over every kind of imaginable thing. It has immorality going on in the church. They're even fighting over spiritual gifts. Some of them are saying, I'm more spiritual than you because I have this gift. Others are saying, well, I'm more spiritual than you because I got saved by the Apostle Paul under his ministry. Another one says, well, I got saved under the ministry of Apollos. Some said, well, I got saved under Peter's ministry. He was, he's the Pope, you know, he's the best. And so all this arguing is fighting and disunity is going on. And, and uh, can you imagine that? Can you imagine a church fighting? Not getting along? It's just hard to imagine. But you, in the church that Paul founded, and yet it was happening. Okay, it's amazing. Matter of fact, if you go to Jerusalem with us sometimes in the future, if we ever get to go back, there's the church of the, called the Church of the Holy Scepter, okay? It's a Catholic church. It was the oldest church in the world, literally, Christian church in the world. And, uh, and, and it has these different fractions of Catholic organizations that have their, like, different places in there that they're in charge of. But they don't get along with each other. Matter of fact, it got so bad, these Christians couldn't get along 600 years ago. They were fighting with each other, these Christians, over different parts of this church that was built literally back around 300 and something uh, A.D. And they can't get along. Say, 600 years ago, you know who they gave the key to the church to? They took it from the Christians, and they gave it to a Muslim in the community. For 600 years, a Muslim family has the key to the church of the Holy Scepter. He opens it every morning. Their family opens it every morning, and they lock it up every evening because the Christians don't get along with each other. 
What a tragedy. And, and, but that's what was happening at the church of Corinth. And Paul writes the first letter to a very carnal and backslidden church. He said, I have to write to you as a bunch of babies. You haven't grown up, you know, and I write to you as carnal. He didn't say you're lost and you're going to hell. He said you're carnal. You're not living like you ought to be living. The book of 2 Corinthians is a letter of comfort to a contrite and broken church because they responded to the first letter and they humbled themselves and they began dealing with the issues in the church. And so Paul writes this letter to comfort them. And you saw that in these first verses. Amen? The Father of mercies, the God of how much comfort? The God of all comfort. Amazing thought. Now, if you want to learn about the great Apostle Paul's ministry and his journeys, you want to learn about his ministry and his journeys, you need to read the book of Acts. Read the book of Acts. You'll see where he went, who he went with, and how he founded these churches. If you want to learn about Paul's theology, you should read and study the book of Romans because he gives great in-depth study to what he believed about Jesus Christ and salvation especially. If you want to learn about Paul's views on the structure and organization of the church, read his epistles that he wrote to the churches. Because as he wrote to Timothy and Titus and Philemon, he wrote these epistles to these individuals and to these churches. He's telling how these churches should run. He gives descriptions of deacons and bishops and elders and such. If you want to know Paul's encouragements and warnings and instructions to pastors, you would read First and Second Timothy and the book of Titus because those were his two pastor boys out doing church ministry. Now, if you want to know his view on church discipline, read the book of 1 Corinthians, okay? Because he tells what to do in some of these situations in that church. Now, if you want to know the heart and the soul of the Apostle Paul, I mean, you want to look inside. Like he, he lifts the curtain of his soul, and you look inside of him, Read the book of 2 Corinthians. If you really want to get to know this man who turned the world upside down for Jesus Christ, read 2 Corinthians. Because 2 Corinthians, he, he shares from his heart. He shares from his soul. He shares from his experiences and how he feels and what he's dealing with. Read 2 Corinthians. And so when you come to chapter 1 of chapter the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul is basically saying, we have a God of all comfort, a God of all comfort. Now, how, how can you and I deal with the problems, the challenges, the difficulties in our personal lives, in our churches, and, and in the world around us, the world that we live in, plus the greater world that's happening as we are now today, like never before you see the news like anywhere in the world, as it happens, you're watching it. I mean, who would have ever dreamed that 40, 30, 40 years ago? I mean, it's, it's happening right in front of us. How, do you deal, how are you going to handle that? How do you deal with that? I believe a couple things, and here's, here's my two main points. We have a God who comforts us, but we also have a ministry as we deal with with hurting, broken people. So not only do I need to be comforted and I need help, I need to understand God has chosen his people to be his ministers. We have a ministry. Every believer is a minister. You got to believe that. Not that, That's what I talked about Doris yesterday. I talked about how she was a minister. She did it through her poems. She did it through her smile. She did it through her family. I mean, this lady was a minister. You don't have to be the pastor, the senior pastor in the pulpit, but you are a minister of God. You have a zip code where you live, right? Everybody has a zip code. Well, I can tell you what your zip code is. 
It's one, two, one, four, one. Did you hear that? One to one, four, one. Everybody lives in that zip code. One to one. One person around you needs help. One to one, four, one. Remember that. And that's everybody's zip code in here. We have a ministry to the person closest to us that needs help. I started to say Pastor Josh over here, <laughs> okay? Minister Josh over here. Preached the other Sunday on who is my neighbor, amen? Who is my neighbor? The neighbor is the person closest to you that needs help, needs help. You have a ministry to that person. And so we need to understand a couple of things. God wants to comfort us, but he doesn't comfort us so that we are comfortable. <laughs> Amen? Did you, you read that text with me? He comforts us, why? So that we can comfort others. That's what that whole passage said that we just read. He comforts us that we might fulfill ministry to comfort others. We have this ministry. So several things that we need to remember as you face problems, difficulties, challenges, listen to the news, need to remember some things, some things we have. Now, chapter 4, you have your Bibles. You can open them up, or I'm not sure how these will show up on the screen. But in chapter 4, I have these in my notes here, but I want to go to the passage itself. In chapter 4, verse 1, Paul says, therefore, having this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. And now, when he says do not lose heart, he means we don't faint, is another way of putting it in old King James, or it means we don't quit. We're not going to be quitters. We're not going to throw in the towel and say, I've had enough. I can't trust God. I don't know. Just too much for me. I'm just going to go into a shell and isolate myself and protect myself, lock the doors, turn off the TV set, you know, and that's not the answer. So Paul says, because we have this ministry, okay, because we've received mercy, what's mercy? God's comforted us through Jesus Christ. He's given us hope. He's given us a salvation. Because we have this ministry, we will not quit. We're not going to quit. We're not going to give up. We're not going to throw in the towel. And so we have a ministry. Now, what ministry is this? Well, if you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 3, so if you want to know what ministry is, you go back to chapter 3. And there's so many things in that chapter, but just to highlight a couple things in verses 5 and 6, he says, not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency of, is of God, who has made us, and by the way, if anybody could have been sufficient in themselves and in their background, it could have been the Apostle Paul. He said under the teaching of Gamaliel, one of the best, greatest, most recognized rabbi teachers in the world at that time. He learned under him. He came from the right tribe. He came from the right people. He had tremendous intellectual abilities. I mean, he could have been sufficient in himself, but not Paul. Paul said, no, my sufficiency is not in myself, but my sufficiency is from God. So don't ever depend upon your natural God-given abilities or your education or things that you've been gifted with your money, whatever it is, your fame. Don't, don't depend on that because that's not what God wants. He wants available people that will humble themselves and just say, here I am, Lord. What do you want me to do? He says, our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter but of the Spirit, for the letter kills but the Spirit gives life. Now, this is interesting. Because what Paul does in chapter 3, he talks and compares the new covenant to the old covenant. Now, the old covenant, by the way, most of you got a Bible, I'm sure, and that Bible's divided into two parts. 
right? And the old part is called the Old Testament, or actually, it's the Old Covenant, the Testament, Covenant, the Old Covenant, which was the law, the Old Covenant. And you got a new part, the back part, it's called the New Testament, the New Covenant. Remember the Lord's Supper, he talks about the New Covenant. The Old Covenant was the law. But the law, all it did basically was bring condemnation and make you realize you're a sinner and you needed help. You couldn't save yourself. That's the law. It was, and what had happened, and even Paul got caught up into it, was the letter of that law condemned without mercy and without any hope. Because the law wasn't there to just simply condemn you it was to bring you to understanding you needed God's grace and mercy to find salvation. And so the old covenant Paul talked about, Moses got from Mount Sinai, and when he got it, his face glowed. He had a veil on. Remember? And you read through that. But Paul says, now, we have sufficiency to be ministers of a new covenant because the Spirit gives life. Paul had a ministry, a witness, a testimony. The law was a ministry of death, but now because he'd experienced Jesus Christ personally, he had the ministry, Romans chapter 8, of life in Christ Jesus. I, I just wish we could grab a hold of this. When you got saved, the Holy Spirit of the living God came to live within your body. And Paul says in Corinthians that our bodies are the temple of God. God dwells inside of you. That means wherever you are, wherever you're at, wherever you go, whatever the situation is, God is there. The Holy Spirit is there. Jesus is there. You are, Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. But then he says, I'm going away. You're the light of the world. You are the light in the dark world in which you live in that zip code, one to one, four, one. Without saying a word, you're a light. It should show up in your face. It should show up in your countenance. It should show up in your reaction to problems and difficulties and challenges. Remember a lady that was a dear neighbor of ours and a dear friend and good, really good friends. Their little 11, 12-year-old boy, Joey, I'm told this story over and again, got killed in a tragic car accident one morning. As she was driving, a lady came across the other side in, into their lane, hit their little Datsun car back then, and it snapped his neck and killed him instantly. The little girl in the back seat, she was, she was injured but okay. The mom was all broken up and had to be in the hospital for a few days even before the funeral. But the nurse that took care of her in the hospital Sherry, Sherry Price, was uh, an agnostic, didn't care for God or anything about God, and Sherry was also my neighbor up about three or four doors, her and her husband. And, uh, and, and, and Sherry, when I would go to visit Mary in the hospital right after the accident, and we were dealing with all this pain and hurt and preparing for a funeral, Mary and I would laugh, and we would talk, and we would remember little Joey and how that God had called him to preach, even as a little kid, and how he brought people to church, and he was a witness, and he set up his tape recorder back in those days, cassette tapes, and he would preach messages. We have a message that he preached on hell. I mean, you ought to hear it. And, and he was an awesome little kid, and, and we would talk and laugh about it. Sherry would come in the room. She was the IV hearse nurse for the hospital. And she would see Mary, and she told us later, she said, when I would see you in that room, she said, I, I could have ate you and chewed you up and spit you out, because I thought, how can you be laughing with this lady? Her son just got killed. Her son just got killed. What kind of respect do you have for this lady whose son got killed? And you're in there laughing and joking and talking. Guess what? Sherry realized that Mary had something she didn't have. Mary had something she didn't have, and Sherry got saved. Her husband got saved. 
They became my Iwana leaders at our church. Guess who helped lead my boys to the Lord? Sherry and Bob, the Iwana leaders through Iwana program. I mean, you deal with its issues and situations, and we're going to see that in just a minute. Let me, let me keep going here. And so what do we have? We have this ministry, a ministry of life. In, in 2 Corinthians 3, 9, for if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds much more in glory. Did you hear that? We have a ministry of righteousness. Righteousness is who God is. He is a righteous God. It's one of the greatest descriptions of God over and again throughout the Bible. He's righteous. He always does, always, always does what is right. Always. He's righteous. That's why he has to judge sin. That's why he has to deal with it, because he's righteous. He he does right. When we do right, we're most like God, amen? And, And we're ministers of righteousness. That's what Paul says. So we have this ministry of righteousness, and the only righteousness that's worth having is the righteousness that's in Jesus Christ. And so Corinthians tells us again, Paul writes, for God made Jesus to be sin for us who knew no sin. Jesus never, ever sinned. He was without sin, perfect, pure, stainless lamb of God without sin without sin. But God made him to be sin for us. In other words, God took my sin, took your sin, every wrong deed you've ever done. But more than just what you did, he took the very essence of your sin, and he placed it on Jesus Christ. And Jesus drank that cup of our sin. And God then poured out his wrath on him on the cross. And Jesus paid the full price for our sin. And that's why that verse says, God laid on him our sin, made him to be sin for us, propitiation of our sin for us, that we, oh, I like this part, might be made the righteousness of God in him. When God sees us as a believer, he sees us robed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And and you're not saved because you go to church, you got baptized, you do good. You're saved only because the righteousness of God in Christ is upon you, and God sees that righteousness. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And that word just means justified, It means basically right with God. You are right with God in Jesus Christ alone. Amen? And Paul says we have this ministry, this ministry to let other people know what this is. Now, as a result of that, and I'm going to try to close this here in the next 30, 40, 50 minutes. (laughs) I thought that would encourage you. Yeah, at the funeral yesterday, they said, no, we don't want this to be a very long service. I said, sure, because they knew me. Uh, We have hope. As a result, we have hope. Look in verse 12 of chapter 3. Therefore, since we have such hope, we use great boldness of speech. Woo! The world doesn't have hope. And we can boldly proclaim a real, genuine hope. That's not just a wishful hoping for a better future. It's a sure hope. It's based, well, I'm going to see, I'm gonna, don't, I don't want to get ahead of myself. We have freedom. Verse 17, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. We have hope. So we're not walking around, oh, poor old me. I wonder what's going to happen. I wonder what this world's coming to. You know, no, 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 no. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you have been robed in his righteousness, you have hope and you have freedom. Enjoy life. Smile. 
Amen. Be joyful. Not because everything's happening good around you, but because you have Jesus. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, Paul said, rejoice. And you know where Paul was when he's writing that? He's in prison. He's between two soldiers. He doesn't know what the future holds, but he says rejoice anyway, always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, chapter 4, verse 1, one more time. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we don't lose heart. Now, I'm going to try to conclude this by looking at chapter 4. If you ask me what my favorite verse in the Bible was, I would say maybe the key verse I took as a young pastor, young Christian, was Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing, that he who begun the good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. So that's been like my life's verse. But if I had a life's chapter, I would choose 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And, and there's a lot of reason behind that, but it's become my life's chapter. Because I find in it what the Christian life is all about. What it's really all about. Despite the bad, the ugly, the difficulty, the hurt, the pain. I mean, I've, I've got a book written about me that tells, that tells the world that I'm an antichrist, I'm a Hitler, I'm a Mussolini, I'm a Jim Jones. You definitely don't want to drink Kool-Aid if the pastor is serving it to you. I've had people that did not appreciate me. <laughs> okay, I appreciate, I'm, I, that's why I'm so thankful when people do appreciate me. I've had people that didn't appreciate us. <clears throat> and what did we do? I can tell you this, I did, did it hurt? Of course it hurt, because I'm human, right? But I didn't fight back. I didn't cuss back. I didn't hurt. I didn't write dirty letters back. I didn't, I didn't sue them. I could have sued them. They had lots of money. I could have sued them and made a lot of money. But we didn't do that. No, we prayed for them. And we made it known that we pray for them and love them and respond the way God wants us to respond. And that's what this chapter is about. And you see it here. And so if our gospel is veiled, it's veiled to those who are perishing in verse 3 in whose minds the God of this world, of this age, has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Jesus Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we don't preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, ourselves, your bondservants, for Jesus' sake. For it's God who commanded the light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So people are lost. They walk about in darkness. They do not know at what they stumble. And you can be mad at them. You can curse at them if you want to, so to speak, and say how terrible, how evil, how wicked you are. But they don't have a clue. Because they're stumbling around in darkness. The God of this age has blinded them. So how are they going to find Jesus? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ is hidden from them. Where is it hidden? Where is this treasure hidden? Look at the next verse. But we have this treasure in an earthen vessel. What, what treasure? The treasure of the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Where? Inside of us. That's where it is. And to just shorten this, you read these verses. But he goes on to say that the excellence of the power may be of God, not of us. So we're like a tent. We're like an earthen vessel, a jar. The glory of God's inside of us is a light. It's like Gideon, remember, with his 300 when he attacked the Midianites, an army that was like you couldn't even count them. There were so many. Remember what they did? They had a, a vessel, they had a light inside of it, and it was hidden. But at the right moment, when they were getting ready to attack, 
they broke those vessels, they held out that light, and they attacked the enemy. And guess what happened? God stepped in and did some awesome things for his people. You know how God gets the light out of us? He has to break us. Tough things happen. That's what he says. We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. We're struck down, but we're not destroyed. And what happens? We're always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be made manifest in our body. And then he says it again, in case you didn't get it. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So the gospel's veiled, remember, to the lost. They can't see it. They can't get it. They can't see They can't find Jesus. Where are they going to find him? They're going to find him in you when you get crushed, when you get knocked down, when you get persecuted. Amen? <laughs> that's a hard, it's hard to say amen to that because that's like saying, okay, pour it on. Bring it on. But when that happens and you respond in a Christ-like, God-like, God is a righteous God, but he's also a merciful God, and he has compassion. And he's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Having received this mercy, Paul said, we're not going to quit. We have this ministry. We're not going to quit. So we have comfort in what? The mercy of God. He's forgiven us of our sin. Man, I have, I have some heart issues, you know. And they scared me at one time, told me as a widow maker, and, you know, you're lucky you're alive. The nurse said, you know, you just need to thank your lucky stars. And, and every now and then I'll be laying in bed, and I start having a pain or something starts going on, and, and, and uh, I don't want to wake up my wife, and I'm thinking, wow, maybe I am having a heart attack. I, I'll miss my family, but why? What a way to die. Just, I'm gone. I'm out of here. They were putting me to sleep in the hospital the other month for something. They were doing a surgical procedure on me just a few months ago, and the lady said, do you have any last things, any last words that you want us to write down before we put you to sleep? I said, oh, goodness sakes, no. I said, I am so ready to go. I don't care if I don't wake up. The doctor said, he said, oh, he's a preacher. Don't listen to him. <laughs> hey, folks. The world needs Jesus. They need the cross. They need the compassion. They need the love. And when somebody spits in your face and you do something kind, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good, they have to say, how did you do that? And you say, well, I wanted to punch you in the mouth, to be honest with you. But God told me to love you and care for you and give you Jesus. And Jesus forgave me, and I forgive you. Amen? And you know what happens? They find that there's something that takes place. They see Jesus. That Jesus, did you see it twice? That the life of Jesus may be made manifest in our body. That the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our mortal flesh. In our mortal flesh. And Paul goes on to say, so how do we do this? He says we look at the things that are eternal, not at the things that are temporal. Because the things that are temporal are passing away, but the things that are eternal, they're forever. So when you get your eyes on Jesus, you're looking on the eternal, and you don't worry about the temporal that passes away. Amen? So when your car gets wrecked, you go, God, that person ran into your car, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> Hallelujah anyway. But God, you're going to have to take care of it and give me another one. Amen? You don't get out and scream and yell at the guy. 
Well, there's so many more things there, but, uh, but that was on my heart. So, so, so where do we get comfort? We get comfort from knowing that Christ rose from the dead the third day. And actually, that's one of the main points of that whole passage of Scripture because he goes back to the resurrection of Jesus Christ, knowing that Jesus is risen. And if you know Jesus is risen and he's alive, you have great comfort. Amen? He died, but he not only died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. When you know that, you can have confidence. And that's why in chapter 5, he says, we know that we have a body in heaven not made with hands. Woo! So if they destroy this body, that's all they can do. And you should read the Fox's Book of Martyrs. You want to read about the believers that died for their faith in Jesus Christ. And they died joyfully. Not, oh, poor old me. I just tried to live for Jesus, and look what happened to me. That's not the way they died. Amen? Oh, Lord, help us. No, they believed in the resurrection. And we do too. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your wonderful, awesome word. We need comfort. And then how we're comforted through your mercies, through your resurrection, through the life of Christ in us, Lord, we can comfort others. And that comfort is basically telling them who Jesus is, not just in our words, but in our lives as we respond to the tough, difficult things in life. So, Lord, again, we, we just pray that we'll all be witnesses for you. We'll be ministers of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus, his resurrection life. And we'll thank you for what you do. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, maybe you have someone in your family or in your circle of friends that, that desperately needs Jesus, desperately needs Jesus. And right now you can just think of their name, you can picture them, but if, if, if that's the case and you really have a heart for them to find Jesus and and would you say, Pastor, pray for me that I can be that kind of believer that they can see Jesus in me as I deal with the tough things in life? Would you just lift your hand right now so I can just say a prayer for everybody that lifts their hand? Okay, a whole bunch of us just everywhere. Our hands are going up everywhere. Yeah, we can see that person. That's our one-to-one, four-one. And Father, I pray right now for all these dear people that have a loved one, have a friend, that needs Jesus. Their eyes have been blinded by Satan. The gospel is hidden to them. But Lord, you want them to know you. You love them. You die for them. And Lord, you've chosen these dear friends in front of me to tell them and to lead them to a place where they can see Jesus even in their mortal flesh. And we pray that will happen. And it'll happen soon. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the day and a great week in Jesus. Amen. And rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. God bless.